One of the unfortunate realities of these kind of conferences or seminars is that uh, there's really never enough time to cover uh, all the materials and the kind of depth that you need to. And, and additionally, it doesn't really provide you for the right context or environment to actually go through a change. We often you know, speak about going, having conferences, even weekend conferences. We talk about having mountaintop experiences where you go away with the guys or with the gals and you have this real profound experience. You come back a changed man until you open the front door and suddenly you meet reality once again and you're back in the same cycle. And one of the things I discovered long ago was that when I would do these uh, seminars, sometimes entire weekends, that that would be the case. People would come down from the mountaintop, they'd get home and, you know, fully intending to be uh, different people. And yet, uh, as soon as they picked up the kids and started going through the process of trying to get life, you know, the kids ready for Monday morning and all the rest, they had basically slipped back into old patterns and they were doing it again. And oftentimes concluding, well, I guess nothing really happened. We didn't really change. It was just an emotional thing, you know, for the weekend. And that was just my wife saying that. So, you know, uh, which I'm very thankful that she's even come to sit in here because usually she doesn't, you know. She told me sometimes that just the, the hypocrisy is so thick I can't stand it. <laughs> and, and so, which is really a better response because she used to just stand up, yell liar, and walk out. <laughs> so there's... There's been real growth in our relationship, so I'm feeling a lot better. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a tough deal. But nonetheless, uh, that's why, basically, I ended up writing the book. Uh, guys kept on encouraging me to do it, and I wrote the book. And what, the way the book is set up uh, is so that um, not only can you read it together, but it has a series of study questions that you can either do individually, and if your spouse isn't talking to you, you can do it on your own. You can do it as a couple or you can do it as a small group. And when I've done these in our own area, a lot of times I've had our congregation actually organize home fellowship groups that would meet for six weeks uh, afterwards because it takes, they say, about 39 days to break a pattern. And so, you know, you can come to something like this and really have some really deep insights and really be impacted, but changing patterns takes time. And so uh, I'm sure that you're all sitting there saying, you know, just... You, you want to get those bracelets, you know, the, remember the ones with WWJD and, and you want to get one that says WWKD, I wonder what Ken would do. Uh, <laughs> and all I can say is no, you don't want to know. <laughs> but uh, um, I just, I give the information, I don't have to live up to it, you know. Anyway, but, but the, the, the simple fact is that it's a tool that we came up with and I can say this fairly confidently because I don't really make any money off of it, which is something my wife has never forgiven me for. Uh, we put up a fund just to be able to use it for missions and different things like that instead of putting it in our own pocket. Now, I, it was easy to do that when I was not sure whether anybody would buy the book. Now it's in its fifth printing. You know, my wife has added it up and going, oh my gosh, <laughs> I could have the house of my dreams if you hadn't done that. Anyway, oh well, <laughs> say la vie. Um, but uh, but I, I would recommend it to you, and obviously that six dollars is well under the list price. But so it's a it's a good deal, and I've been told by people it's actually a pretty good read. That's what I've actually been told. But a lot of a lot of churches actually buy it, buy it because they say it's different from most marriage books out there, simply because it starts with scriptures and works out instead of the other way around. Usually you have a book full of marriage guides and you know working points, and then they throw some Bible verses in there. And I'm not saying they're unbiblical, but it's a lot easier to see the context from which we're trying to bring these things out. And, and my obsession was, I, when my wife and I were first married, our marriage was just miserable, and we couldn't figure out how to fix it. And we just decided that either the Bible is true or it's not, and if the Bible is true, then it must have answers to our problems. And it's one thing to say to people, well, the Bible has all the answers to every problem you ever have. It's quite another thing to go in there and try to find the answer for you. And it was quite a labor. It was quite an effort to sit there and really begin to say, God, you must have answers here for us, but they're not necessarily obvious rightly, uh, right there on the surface or readily apparent. So, like I say, I encourage you to, to, usually when I do this, and since I didn't pay for the books, J.D. did, I can't say this. Usually I just say, you don't have the money, take the book. <laughs> just take the book, and, and, and that's not the point. It's not about making money. It's about just getting some working materials into people's hands so it can make a difference. By the way, if you want another free resource, if you like worship, my uh, youngest son has just put out a, uh, a worship album. It's actually they're, they're, it's based upon a worship uh, website. There, It's actually a ministry worship, and uh, it's, it's a lot of people are starting to already do some of the music, but he uh, uh, very, very well, very uh, professionally produced. In fact, it was uh, the guy who did Tim uh, did uh, you know Matt Redman and Chris Tomlin, the same guy who produced this one for him, and it's free. 
you can just go to their website and download it. Just click and download it. So it's uh, called, just go to reality, uh, realitylamusic.com. That's the name of their church, is Reality LA. And they're right in Hollywood. And uh, the only Bible teaching church in Hollywood. But realitylamusic.com. And you can just click on it. It's right there on the front page. And it'll automatically download the MP3s. And you're good to go. It's kind of, the only thing I would say is it's, it is uh, pretty contemporary. It's, it's, uh, the, your college kids would really like it. The high school kids really, really like it. But our people have been able to actually glean out uh, the melody enough so they can actually sing the songs. <laughs> but uh, well, we kind of like that, that level of music too, but you know, a lot of people don't. So anyway, just some information, some housekeeping stuff for you there to hopefully be a blessing to you. But um, uh, there's so much I would like to be able to talk with you about today, and I really don't have... A lot of time, but would you turn with me to, to uh, Revelation? Excuse me, Revel Genesis chapter three, uh, because I want to be able to work through the entire Old Testament and New Testament by the time we finish. <laughs> so this session is going to be sixty-eight hours long, uh, but uh, this is a fairly fundamental thing because I really call this 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 session "Why is being happily married so difficult?" And before you say, well, if you knew my husband, you wouldn't ask that question. <laughs> and you may be absolutely right. But there's some deeper dynamics here that are fundamental to us all that I think are significant for us to try to get our hearts and minds around. Uh, but in chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty, literally you mean shrewd or subtle or a sly, than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the, spear of the, tree, the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked, and so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound, or literally the voice of the Lord God, as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord said, Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Uh, and the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. And so the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I shall put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her. And he will crush your head and he will strike your heel. Let's begin with prayer. Father, I ask that you would uh, just speak to us from this time that we're going to spend considering not only what your word says, but how it relates to us as as married couples, even as individuals in our relationship dealings on a daily basis. We pray for your grace in this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, start with a, a story. Uh, several years ago, back in the days when people still relied upon TV antennas, there was a, a couple in, in Southern California who uh, uh, faced a tragedy in their life. They lost their television reception. And in most of medical America, that's, I mean, you know, you can cut off the electricity, you can starve me, but don't take away my TV. And so uh, what happened was a windstorm had blown through the night before and had knocked the TV antenna over. It apparently wasn't tightened enough at the, at the hinge point, and so it just bent over and was laying flat on the roof. Well, the gentleman knew what he needed to do to repair it. The only problem was he had a tremendous fear of heights. And so he spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out how he was going to get up there and repair this antenna. And then he had a, a flash of inspiration, <laughs> once again. And uh, he remembered how that he saw how some house painters would tie a, a rope to the bumper of their truck. They would go up the ladder, climb, climb to the eaves of the, of the roof, and then slide down, and then do their work uh, you know, supported by the rope. And he thought, well, that's what I'll do. I'll tie it to the bumper of my car. I'll climb up on the roof. I'll cl crawl up to the peak. I'll slide down. And then I can make the adjustments, and everything will be wonderful. Well, everything was working out quite fine, except 
Like many men, he forgot one simple detail, and that was to tell his wife what he was doing. Uh, she, in turn, realized that they needed to buy some things at the store, and so she ran out to the car, started the ignition, and backed the car out of the driveway. Well, he's about ready to tighten the nut on the, on the antenna, and suddenly he feels himself being drugged up the side of the roof, tumbling back down, crashing with the ground. But the problem was his wife was not aware of it. She was looking behind her and backing up and pulling out of the driveway, and then she just drove away. Well, fortunately, one of the neighbors saw what was transpiring and actually stopped her before she, you know, basically ground him quite literally to ground beef. But he, uh, uh, he was severely injured. And so, you know, they took him to the hospital. He spent the next two weeks with a number of broken bones, contusions, and road burns. And he was really in bad shape. But he was, he, was, he, was, he was recovering enough to be able to come home. Well, they, they brought him home. They were going to bring him home, and she wanted to show him how appreciative she was of, I mean, how bad she felt about what had happened to him, and so she invited all of their friends over for a big party. The problem was is that, you know, they were smokers. All of their friends were smokers, and they had all of those little ashtrays. Remember the ashtrays you had the cigarette lighters used to be built right into them? I'm, some of you look like you're old enough to remember that. Don't pretend like you don't. But please don't tell me you don't remember. Anyway, so she decided that what she would do is make sure that everything was ready. And, and, and part of the last preparations was to put lighter fluid in all of these, these little cigarette lighters to make sure they were full. And not wanting an accident, she decided to do it over the toilet bowl so there wouldn't be any spillage anyplace else that could lead to a fire. Well, everything was great. She gets ready. She goes to the hospital, picks up her husband. She brings him home. And the first thing he does when he gets back in the house is he needs to use the bathroom. Well, he goes into the bathroom, and he sits down on the toilet and pulls out a cigarette and decides to light it. And after he lights a cigarette, he parts his leg, and he drops the match between his legs. <laughs> um, his name was Bill. Now it's Janet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, whether it's a true story or not, I don't know. I, I kind of doubt it. I found it on the Darwin Awards website, so who knows? But I, I like the story anyway because I think it illustrates something that, that is kind of true of life. And that's that life is often, uh, often has consequences or circumstances that you don't anticipate. And that's because we live, according to the Bible, we live in a sinful world. We live in a broken world that we live in a world that's going from a state of disorder to, di to uh, from a state of order into disorder. That's why I don't look like I did when I was 21. I mean, I, I, I'm, in, I'm experiencing what's called the decaying process. And I'm told that by the time I hit 25, I started going downhill. And my wife says I think it started much earlier than that. But nonetheless, it, it's part of the way the world operates. We're, we're in, a, in a world that's subject to the principles of entropy. Everything's going from a state of order to disorder, which is one of the problems you find, one of the reasons why the Big Bang Theory is, is starting to lose, you know, uh, credibility in the scientific community is because it basically postulates that out of chaos came order. And we have no place in the universe where we've ever seen chaos producing order. So we see just the opposite all the time. We see things start out in an orderly fashion and they go into a state of chaos. And that is the whole direction of the universe. The Bible tells us it's not only true of the material universe, it's also true of the spiritual reality in which we live. That when Adam and Eve sinned, what happened, sin introduced into uh, the, the, the world a toxic element. So in the same way, if you take a toxin into your system, it poisons you and leads to uh, morbidity. It kills you. The same thing is true of sin. Sin is deadly. Sin is something that basically you're highly allergic to. It's something that is deadly for you, which makes our, our attraction to it so, so ponderous. Why are we so attracted to something that's so destructive? And yet, if you've ever known a drug addict or an alcoholic, you've seen the example of someone who knows that continuing in their behavior is self-destructive, but they don't seem to be able to stop it. That just as physical gravity causes things to go down, we are pulled down by this force and this power. When Adam and Eve kind of opened that Pandora box by their disobedience, a disobedience was really predicated on one simple concept. To obey God was not as good a deal as to disobey him. I mean, when you get down to what was Satan's deception, he said, God is holding out on you. You're missing out on a great opportunity. So if you disobey God, a better life will be yours. Anybody ever fallen into that trap? Have you ever noticed that every time you disobey the Lord, every time you sin against what you know God wants you to do, it's always because you believe it's in your own best interest? 
And I guess my question is, so how's that working for you? <laughs> if, if, like me, it didn't work out so very well and, and, and continues not to work out so well. One of the things you discover is that the way of the Lord is the way of life. But what we have an opportunity to do, and I don't have time to go into the whole doctrinal aspects of the, of the fall, as chapter 3 of Genesis referred, because I want to focus really on how Adam and Eve dealt with it. Because it's one thing to know how we became sinners, but the fact of the matter is we are sinners. We're there now. <laughs> we live in this every day of our life. And, you know, before they sinned, you have to understand, they had never had the experience with it, but we have been birthed into it. We were shaped in iniquity. So all our life we have been living in, in the influences and the effects of sin, and as a consequence we become fairly adjusted to it. And it's kind of like a, a child that grows up in an abusive home, you kind of adjust to being in an abusive home. A being abused becomes actually, in a very twisted, sad way, normal. And one of the hardest things is to convince somebody who's in that kind of a situation that this is not normal. And what the, what the devil tries to do is to convince us that what is abnormal is normal. So that we'll accept a degenerative state of affairs. And so if you have people who, you know, family members who like to get together and drink and party hardy, and they're always trying to get you to join in with them because as long as you don't, you're kind of standing apart and saying, you know, what you're doing isn't right. They know that inside, but they're desperately trying to convince themselves that it's not wrong, and it's not a problem, and... If you won't join in with them, you become, they, then they'll say things like, you, yeah, I've had those people come up to me and say, uh, you want a drink? I said, no, thank you. Why are you judging me? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it's because they, they have that judgment also already inside of themselves. My point is this. We're all sinners. We know it. And we live with it and we deal with it. But what is fascinating to me is to see how Adam and Eve dealt with the reality of their sin. And you discover it's exactly the same way you and I do today. In fact, there's a series, you might say, of a, a downward steps that they begin to, to go, down, go through. That basically, by believing this, a half-truth, if you will. He said, you know, if you eat of this fruit, you'll, you'll become like God and that you'll have knowledge of good and evil. What he didn't tell them is, you may have the knowledge of good and evil, but you won't have the power to resist the evil or the power to do the good. And so as a consequence, they found themselves having to deal with a dynamic that was more difficult than anything they ever faced in their life. But what I want to focus on is how they dealt with the knowledge of sin. Because the very first thing we read about them partaking of the forbidden fruit, whatever it was, and coming from Washington, I guarantee you it wasn't an apple. Uh, but, but whatever that was, the thing, first thing it tells us is it says their eyes were opened. The first thing there was their eyes were opened. Now, having your eyes open to certain things is not a blessing. To discover that somebody, your business partner, partner has been cheating you, or to find out that your wife has been unfaithful, or to discover that your husband is having an affair with his computer at night on the Internet. That, you know, your eyes being open to that is not a pleasant thing. I've had many people say, I just really would have preferred to have never known than now have to see the reality. Because what they're open to was this dark side of things. Their eyes were open to the reality of evil. Evil didn't come into the world at that point, but their awareness of evil became a point, uh, clear at that point, And they ended up becoming agencies of the agents of the evil which they hated. And that's where we find ourselves many times, don't we? We find ourselves, Paul said, the good I want to do, I don't do. The evil I don't want to do, I find myself doing. So I find myself the agent of evil that I hate. But I can't stop doing it. And nonetheless, I hate the fact that I do it, and therefore I end up hating myself. What I'm saying is that sin is such a heavy weight that essentially it's unbearable. It's a weight that is so great that it cannot help but hold you down. So that I recall the moment I asked Christ into my heart and I asked him to forgive my sins, I remember without having any kind of expectation of feeling anything, because nobody told me I was going to feel anything, but I remember getting up off my knees and feeling as if chains had been let loose, that a heavy burden had been unloaded off of my shoulders that I didn't even realize I was carrying. I literally felt like I, I was able to float on air. It was just such a release in my life. And I, it was the first time I realized that I had carried guilt and shame so intensely. And to have that guilt and shame taken from me, well, it was just it was this marvelous thing that, that left an indelible imprint upon my mind. 
So you have to understand about Adam and Eve. Here they are, living with a clear conscience, living without any guilt, without any shame, without any remorse, and suddenly their eyes are open to the fact that not only have they done evil, but they have become evil. They have become evil. And that's what the Bible says, you know. Jesus said, when they said, good master, you know... Uh, uh, what do we need to do to enter the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. That we are, by, by nature, our human nature, we are evil. Only God is good, and we only become good in as much as we allow God to rule and domi have dominion over our lives. So that, you know, when, I, when people come to me and say, Pastor, I know you're going to be shocked when I tell you what, I, what I'm struggling with, and then they share some dark sin. And, and I always tell them, say, well, believe me, I'm not shocked. You know, it's kind of like saying, do I get shocked if water comes out of a water fountain? <laughs> no. Do I get shocked when rain falls from the sky? No. Do I get shocked when pigs fly? Occasionally. But, uh, <laughs> but the whole point is that what else? You're, you are by nature a sinner, and when ugly stuff comes out of you, I don't sit back and go, I can't believe that. Nor does God. God doesn't look at your sin and say, I was thinking so much more of you. No, God is shocked when you do good. You know, God is shocked when you get it right. I mean, I, if, 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 if I get shocked is the right word to use for God. I think that, that God knows our weakness. He knows that we are but flesh. And he doesn't excuse it. He doesn't, he doesn't appreciate it. He doesn't value it. But at the same time, he understands our weakness. And particularly when you look at Adam and Eve, it just strikes me so significantly that we find that the very first thing that, that is manifest is this concept of guilt and shame. And we see it in this way. It says they went and they hid themselves. They went and hid themselves. You see, all of us have some dark side in our life that we hope nobody else finds out about. Uh, Mark Twain put it this way. Everyone is like the moon. We have a dark side we hope nobody will ever see. And I think that's true. You know, I think one of the most liberating things for me when I first got married when is when I began to share with my wife the things in my life that had really haunted me and been things I felt guilty and ashamed about and say, this is who I really am. This is the stuff that's taken place in my life. That confession somehow was able to separate me from the action and was the beginning of a healing process in my own life. Because I did some really nasty, rotten things to people. I mean, things that I feel very guilty about uh, before I was a Christian because I just knew they were wrong and I damaged people. You know, you get in the world of drugs and alcohol and there's just a lot of ugly things that happen. And so here I am loaded with this guilt. And that's what it says is that their eyes are open and they realized that they were naked. They realized they were naked. What happens when you realize you're naked? You realize that you should be clothed. <laughs> You know, I, when I was a teenager, I used to fantasize going to a, one of those uh, clothing optional beaches. And then I went to Europe and I was on beaches where they don't wear clothes. And I wanted to say, put it back on! <laughs> ooh, ooh! <laughs> you know, because it, it was such a disillusionment. The, problem, <laughs> the simple fact is that the idea of being naked wasn't what they were talking so much about the physical nakedness, but suddenly everything was on the surface. And if everything in your life was put out in the surface, I mean, every thought you're having, every thought you might be thinking about what I'm saying right now, boy, would you be embarrassed. Aren't you glad I can't read minds? <laughs> I remember when my, my wife told me her pastor had the gift of discerning spirits, and I didn't know what it was, but I, that was pretty scary to me. And I thought, if he can discern spirits, and he knows what I'm thinking. <laughs> oh, I better not touch her. <laughs> you know, it's just, I, felt like I felt so exposed for the slime ball I was, the lecher I was, that I didn't, you know, I was terrified that they might realize where I'm at. But you see, before we're told in chapter 2 that they were naked and they felt no shame, now they're naked and what do they feel? They feel shamed. Do you realize that every one of us goes around through life feeling a lot of shame? I mean, we, we really do feel shame for all sorts of things. And we live in a culture that is so designed to motivate you to buy things by making you ashamed of who you are. Your car's not good enough. Your clothes aren't good enough. You know, you're not pretty enough. You're not handsome enough. You're not tall enough. You're too short. You're too tall. You're too wide. You're too skinny. I mean, it's, it just goes on and on and on and on. We're, we're giving all these images out here that we feel that we have to measure up to, and none of us do. I have a friend who uh, ran, runs a, a major modeling agency. I mean, with th these are like top-notch Ford, you know, you see them on the Madame as well, and Madame as well, Madame as well, yeah. Anyway, those, those magazines, you know. And I was talking to her one time, and she said, you know, every one of my girls has a glaring area of physical fault that they're embarrassed about. 
And I said, you've got to be kidding. He says, no, what you see on the cover, that's not really them. They go in afterwards with Photoshop and they, they crop everything. They shave the hips. They make the, you know, they do a whole, a whole job. They make them look much better than what they actually look. That person doesn't exist in real life. It's the same way with, with uh, pornographic stuff. Those people don't exist in the real life. They are an airbrushed, Photoshop cropped and shaped uh, vision of something that is somehow the ideal of the, of the hour that we're in, but they don't exist in re reality. They're not a real person. They're, what they're selling is a fantasy. And so as a consequence, he said, here are these girls who are considered to be the, the beauties around the world, and yet in reality, they'll, they all just tear themselves down. And I think that's one of the things I find very fascinating about men versus women, because do you know that women, gentlemen, your wife does not think she's attractive. And when you say to her, honey, I love you just the way you are, she says, right, sure, yeah. She doesn't believe it. You know, but we have this concept, never mind, we have this concept that, that women are just hung up on beauty. They're just hung up on stuff because we say, look at all the clothes they have in their closet. Look at the money they spend on makeup. You know, and you know, guys, you have those same conversations that I do. Well, my wife says, I don't have anything to wear. You know, there used to be this walk-in closet that we shared. We don't share it anymore. It's full of all the stuff she doesn't have. And, and I, I mean, as I begin to query her about this, what, what do you mean? She says, well, I don't have anything new. I don't have anything for, you know, and I thought, <laughs> this is a really interesting thing because you know how, how guys are. I mean, we, we can kind of get by with, in fact, my wife used to always complain to me. She, you know, says, you, you just wear the same style year in, year out. You never change anything. And, you know, it was the first time in my life until the kids started berating me and telling me how to shop and what I should need to wear that, I mean, it was like, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? And you, as a guy, as we sit back and think, well, that's because we're not, we're not into the flesh. You know. <sighs> Take me as I am. But the simple fact is that women spend billions of dollars on makeup because they don't think they're pretty. Just the opposite of what we often think. That women basically go around thinking that they're, they're unattractive. And that's why when you see your wife spending all this time making sure that everything is in perfect place, she's not doing that because she wants to make sure that she just looks so incredibly beautiful, but, but rather because probably she's convinced that she's not. And so, you know, what she's yearning for you to do is to communicate to her that you find her lovable and you find her attractive, but she has these other voices from the culture around her that are screaming at her face and saying, if you get old, if you get wrinkled, if you get gray, if you get this, you get that, then your value as a person is depreciating. And so as a result, we find that a lot of women are, are living with this really kind of a secret shame, kind of a self-loathing, a really a, a harsh critical attitude towards themselves. But you see, men are just as guilty on a different level and in different ways. That oftentimes, men, we are so aware of our shortcomings as husbands and fathers. Or maybe just as men. I mean, we take a beating from the culture. We go out in the, out in the workplace every day. And does your boss see you coming in and saying, Oh, Bill, I'm so glad you're here. You know, I just, I just love the fact that you work here. And I just hope you'll stay here for the rest of your life. Can I give you a raise? Uh, are you making enough money? I mean, is there anything I can do? Can I buy you a truck? Can I... Anybody have a job like that? Are they hiring? <laughs> no, what we do is we go out there and we're constantly reminded that we're only as good as the last project. We're only as good as the last thing we did. And we better keep up. And we're pounding, pounding, pounding. And then what happens many times is even in the homes, many times we come home and our wives point out to us the things we forgot to do and didn't do and you said you would do and you need to do this and you don't do that. And then you, you find that you go to church and the pastor gets up there and says, men, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And I think to myself, Christ died on the cross. I am in trouble. <laughs> and so we each carry with us this deep sense of inadequacy, this deep sense of failure, this deep sense of not being good enough, not measuring up. So how do we deal with that? We do what Adam and Eve did. We go and we make coverings for ourselves. We make coverings for ourselves. <laughs> I made the joke at the last, when I was in Florida doing this seminar a few weeks ago, and I was talking about, you know, we go out and we buy a toupee and a red sports car and pretend we're still young. Uh, a guy came up to me and said, um, 
I just bought a red sports car, but I don't have a toupee yet. <laughs> I thought, gosh, i got to come up with some new illustrations because well, I don't mean to offend anybody, and I don't think there's nothing wrong with a red Ferrari. In fact, if you wanted to buy me a, uh, one of the new Ferrari Californias, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, but aside from my own personal wish list, my church is so tight, they won't buy me one. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> But you see, what they did is they, it says they made coverings for themselves. And I love this story. How did they make coverings? They took fig leaves, sewed them together, and made coverings. Now, I don't know, have any of you ever picked figs? You ever had that, that great occupation? I did that as a kid working at the farms. I did it one day, and I couldn't stand it because it was 110 degrees out, which I was used to, but we had to wear long pants, long sleeves, socks and shoes, rubber gloves with the collars buttoned up to the top because... Two things happen when you pick a fig. Number one, there's this white foam that oozes out of the stem when you pick it. And if you get that on your skin, it actually stains your skin's black. The other thing is that they have these little fibers all over them on the leaves. And if you get those in your skin, it's like fiberglass in your skin. And you get these welts and it itches like crazy. And I'm thinking to myself, fig leaves around my genitals? <laughs> All this does is magnify the problem. And that's what happens when we try to cover up our inadequacies. We just end up doing something that makes it more obvious. In fact, I remember when I was uh, 12 years old, my mom made me go in and get braces on my teeth. And, uh, you know, I asked her, please, can I wait till I'm in college and I don't have a future? Um, you know, I said, then I won't care anymore. Uh, but she insisted on it. And so... Uh, I went and got these braces, and I wore these, you know, it looked like, back in those days, it looked like something off a, Ford, off a, a DeSoto, you know, the front grill of a DeSoto. I mean, they were just as massive, it was just like, very Frankensteinish. you know, you'd go in, and they'd have these wires, and they'd tighten the wires with pliers to pull the teeth together. It was a brutal, brutal process. But anyway, you have no idea what I've suffered. Anyway, but... Um, but I remember after I got them off, and I had straight teeth, you know, I, I thought, well, that's, that's behind me, and I move on. And I remember one day, at like 16, I was talking with some girl, and she said, you used to wear braces, didn't you? I said, well, yeah, how'd you know? She says, because every time you laugh, you always put your hand over your mouth and cover your mouth. And I thought, here I am, still compensating for this embarrassing part of my life, because in those days, there weren't a lot of guys that had the front of a DeSoto in their mouth. And, so, and yet I was still carrying out that compensating behavior. Do you know, friends, we do that all the time with each other? That many times when your wife or your husband says something about you that you perceive as critical, you have certain behavior patterns that you developed a long time ago as a way of protecting yourself from being hurt, a way of covering up what you're being exposed to. But see, the problem is that cover-ups don't work. They, they eventually break down. And so what we do is then we begin, when, when covering up doesn't work, when excuses don't work, when self-justification doesn't work, you know, it's kind of like your wife finds you watching the Internet and she's going, what are you doing? And you're saying, I'm just doing research. You know, she says, research on what? Research is on naked bodies and I was just testing to see whether I'd be attracted. You know... That may be, that maybe that works in some areas, you know, because I remember when I was in college and guys would always, you know, subscribe to Play, Penthouse or Playboy magazine, and they say, you know, I, I buy it for the articles, you know. <laughs> really, I mean, we still, all everybody said that, I just get it for the articles, got some great articles in there. You know, but the reality is that I don't know if they had great articles. I never got to the articles. I just was hung up on the pictures. And, and the point was that, that that was all a compensation. It was kind of an excuse. But the reality is when you couldn't get away from it, when you're finally caught in the corner, you know what you do? You project on somebody else. You blame them. You say, well, it's not my fault. It's your fault. So the husband who gets caught looking at the Internet says to his wife, well, if you were more sexy, I wouldn't be going here for this because I need this kind of stimulation. It's your fault. Wow, that works really good. It really worked good for Adam and Eve, you know, really good for Adam. Adam, what are you doing? I'm hiding. Why are you hiding? Because I'm naked. Who told you you're naked? It's not that God didn't know. God's getting at, trying to get Adam to admit the truth. <laughs> Who told you you're naked? And what's the answer? He doesn't answer the question. He says, the woman that you gave me, by the way, and suddenly it's no longer Adam's fault. It's the woman's fault. You gave her to me. And so he's displacing rela responsibility for his actions on his wife. And when he goes to the woman and says, well, what is it you've done? She said, the snake. <laughs> you know? And he turns to the snake, and the snake goes, and goes off in the woods. I mean, 
And do you see what I'm getting at? Your fights, your conflicts, your, your difficulties in your marriage, isn't this the way your arguments work? You start with one issue, and instead of talking about that issue, you start finding reasons to blame each other for the problem. You know, we don't have enough money in our bank account. Well, it's not my fault. You know, and, you, and you go back and forth. Instead of saying we don't, well, let's really look and see what the problem is and see where the fault is. And if it's my fault, then I, I want to know that so I can change my behavior and pray that God will change. We don't do that. We immediately react based upon a reaction pattern that goes probably back to our childhood. That's probably the reaction pattern you saw your parents using. So that, you know, I, I knew I became a, a yeller. I mean, I would just start yelling and ranting and chanting and saying all these things. And I realized one day, that's my dad. That's, my, that's how my dad dealt with all the arguments. He'd yell and scream and rant and rave and tromp and go out in his car and drive away and get drunk and yell. And I mean, I think, I've become my father. Yeah, I've become my father because that's how I learned to deal with stress. And as my wife and I have really grown over the years, we've come to realize that we have all these reactive patterns that we engage in that are based upon the way that our parents dealt with stress and dealt with difficulty, how they resolved problems. So I got a call from someone yesterday who was hoping they could persuade their sister to come to this conference because they're, they're in the process of getting a divorce. The part that he didn't want to tell me was the fact that his, his sister has left her husband and her three kids for another man, which is exactly what their mother did when she was the same age. You know Ernest Hemingway, at the age of 61, put a shotgun to his, under his chin and pulled the trigger and blew his brains out. What we don't realize is Ernest Hemingway's father, at the age of 61, took a handgun out of his desk and put it to his head and blew his brains out. What was he doing? When he came to that same point in his life where he was overwhelmed by the certain stresses he felt unfulfilled, he just simply did what his dad did. So was I shocked when his granddaughter came to this point of stress in her life and she took a bunch of pills and tried to kill herself? You see, it's, it's this generational thing, but it's not generational sense of it's genetic. It's generation because the parents see how the fathers and moms deal with things and they then deal with themselves. So that one of the things you have to understand is that you have these habitual patterns of responding to things. What God is trying to do is restructure your life. But here's the problem. Being restructured is a pretty painful deal. We, we, we paid off our house uh, a little over a year ago. And so we decided, you know, uh, now's a good time for us to go in and remodel our house. Um, just a word of advice. There's never a good reason or a good time to remodel your house. It's easier just to burn it to the ground and start over. <laughs> You know, we waited three months for the cabinet guy just to finish the cabinets. And we're praying to heaven that when we get home, they'll actually all be installed. But, I mean, this process was taken more than a year. It looks nice. I mean, if you can get past all the dust. But the reality is that it's, it's an arduous, difficult process. And one of the things the guys were doing is as they would go in and open up walls, and they'd go, uh-oh. <laughs> and suddenly you're going, huh. Okay, well, this is going to be a little more involved than we thought. You got leakage here. You got dry rot there. And that this isn't supported right. And you're, and you're going through all these kinds of things. And you're thinking, if I had known, I would have not gone into it. But that's the way it is. Change is a, is an arduous and a difficult process. And but it's really one of those things that if I really want to experience the abundant life that Christ has promised me then I have to be willing to submit to that process of change. And your spouse is the key tool that he has given to you in your life to facilitate those changes. And it's important that you understand that. Because again, as I talked about earlier, if we try to change tools, we just exchange it for another of the same kind. But God will bring, continue to bring into our life the same abrasive personality that we need to be abraded so that we can begin to change. And so it's an interesting thing. The thing that frustrated me most about my wife is that my wife is not a person who knows how to lie. She's a horrible liar. She just, she's a horrible liar. She, just, she, she has a necessity. It's one of those people, don't ask her what you think. She'll tell you. You know, she'll just tell you. I mean, she, you know, she doesn't want to hurt your feelings, but she says, well, you know. That's why people say, well, well so did you like my song? No. You know, or sometimes just, um... 
Been playing wrong? <laughs> it's just, but you know, so here I am with this woman whom I want to lie to me. Tell me I'm okay. Tell me I'm wonderful. And she said, well, but you're not. And I realized how that what I needed was that kind of confrontation. I needed somebody to be honest with me, to tell me the truth. But it took me a long time to appreciate that honesty and that directness. She was the one, you know, those people that will allow herself to be manipulated. And it's interesting how God, you know, when I was talking about earlier about the difference between men and women, one of the things that I think men often miss, really underestimate or underappreciate about women is because women, you know, think about things with both sides of their brain at the same time, they tend to be far more intuitive about people and circumstances than men are. That there's, I found that before I hire somebody, I've got to ask my wife, what do you think? What do you think? In fact, uh, we had for a while this process that anybody we brought on staff had to go through an interview process with my, my administrator and uh, two, of, two of the ladies on my staff. Because I find that women have a way of picking up things that men can't. But I remember my wife would say something, you know, I just don't feel right about that person. I'd say, well, what, what's wrong with them? I don't know. I just don't feel right. Well, I, I can't base it on your feelings. I need facts, you know. We can't just judge people based upon how we have this feeling. I've got to have facts, you know. I'm a factual guy. You know, I deal with facts. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And, <laughs> and I have so many t I told you so's in my life because of that. That sooner or later, my wife would pick up, was picking up something that I couldn't see, but given time, it would just kind of percolate to the surface, and I'd go, oh my gosh. She was absolutely right. There's something there that isn't right. There's something there that isn't wrong. And you see, if you value that in your spouse, then you are better. Two are better than one. But what happens with men many times, we devalue that perception. We devalue that side of it. And you see, this, this whole idea of being brought together for a specific purpose, not only to identify the areas of weakness in my life, but also to be my deepest companion to help me work through those things. Because what I need in my life more than anything else is a right heart with God. I mean, that's what I need. One of the things I've discovered is God is more concerned with the work that he wants to do inside of you than any work he'll ever do through you. We want to focus on the externals, the work, what we're doing. But God says, no, what I really care about is what's going on in the inside of you. God says, I created the heavens and the earth in six days, and then I took the weekend off. It's not, you know, the, doing stuff is easy for God. Can we agree on that? Flinging the stars from his fingertips? I mean, doing stuff is really easy for God. The one, but there's only one thing in all the Bible that God says he rejoices over, and that's when one sinner comes to repentance. Now, you ever think about why would God rejoice over a sinner coming to repentance? Because it's the one area in where God, in his, his unlimited power and sovereignty, has limited himself. He will not force you to turn from your sins and seek his face. And so the angels said, all the angels in heaven rejoice when one sinner comes to repentance because it's the one thing that God has left to man to choose for himself. We don't see him, re we don't hear the angels rejoicing when Lazarus was raised from the dead. You know why? Because to them it was just another ho-hum moment. I mean, if you've seen the universe created in a split second, raising Lazarus from the dead ain't no big deal. Healing a body is no big deal. Of course they know God can do it. He can cause anything He wants to happen to take place. But to change your heart, now that's something that takes some work. Because God has to get us to freely choose. Because you know what God wants from you? He wants you to choose to love Him. He wants you to choose that. It's like, and it makes a lot of sense because, you know, the most exciting moment for me was when I finally got the nerve to ask my wife to marry me and she said yes because I didn't feel like it was a sure deal. I could look at my own self and come up with a lot of reasons why she would want to say no. But that fear, you know, that she might say no was great. So when she did say yes, it was like the greatest thing that ever happened. And I suddenly realized God is waiting for you to say yes to him. And not just in coming to Christ, but also in learning to live with Him and to follow Him and to serve Him every day of your life. That I really believe that every time I come to the Lord and say, Lord, I have sinned and I'm wrong and I need to change, that God sees this as an amazing moment. But because of this dynamic of sin that exists in every one of us, this is not a sure thing. It's not a sure thing that, that you're going to be willing to humble yourself before God and go through the change process. You can always say no to God as well as you can say yes. That's why Alfred Weilersmith called it God's great gamble. They gave us the ability, the capacity to say no to God. 
And this particularly is true when you talk about the marriage relationship. Because you see, what you're going to find in your relationship with each other is God is going to use each other to bring to the surface sins in your life that God wants to change. But the question is, will you say yes to God or will you say no? Will you say no by saying, it's not my fault, I'm not responsible, I can't help my... And go through this whole list of things. Or are you willing to say, you know, I have sinned. The greatest healing that began to take place in my wife and I's relationship is when we begin to confess our sins to God be with one another. When we would come together and pray and each of us would say, Lord, I have sinned, forgive me for what I have done. It's an it's amazing and wonderful moment in your life when you come to that kind of surrender and confession. But, there, but that is so hard for us to let that barrier down. And that, so the old saying, you know, the family that prays together stays together. It doesn't mean that family that has a rote liturgical prayer that they do as a matter of religious practice. Because a lot of families do that. They get together and say, okay, Johnny, it's your turn to pray for the food. God is good. God is great. Thank you for the food we're about to eat. You know, it's like, and, you know, do you think God's going, oh, I just, I just love having fellowship with you? <laughs> No, I'm talking about a family when they really they get together and they really pray together. And so much of prayer is confession. So that this whole dynamic, it's, 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 I know it may seem kind of abstract and kind of removed from what goes on, but you have to understand that for the marriage to move forward, it has to have place for that spiritual dimension. Because you see, most of us, and particularly us men, are guilty of inverted priorities. You see... Every woman is looking for two things from you men. She's looking for your provision and she's looking for your protection. She wants you to provide for her and he wants, she wants you to pr protect her. But most men see that and the first thing we think is, okay, I'm buying a gun and I'm going to make a lot of money. Therefore, I can buy her all the stuff and I can say, see, I love you, I've done my job, you've got a couch, you've got a car, you've got a house, and if anybody tries to get in the front door, they're dead meat. Feeling lucky, punk, you know, you, you just, you're all ready to go and think, I've done my job. And, and I'm not saying that's, that's wrong at all. I, I think that is part of the job. But it's the last thing, the least important thing. Because what did Jesus say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. How do you provide and protect for your, your, your wife and your family? Number one, you provide for them spiritually and you protect them spiritually. Your family needs more than anything else. Uh, and I really believe this. I believe that the most attractive man to a woman is a man who is in love with God. Because women can learn sooner or later in life, a man on his own is not safe. I mean, even sociologists have found that women civilize men. Single men are the most violent, disruptive element within any society. And so if you want a stable society, get guys married. Because women civilize them. But the point is that what are they looking for from this uncivilized beast that they've married? They want him to, first of all, become a man of God who is seeking God's will because if he's, if he's seeking to please God, he will be responsive to the Holy Spirit and become the man that you want him to be. That's where it's got to begin. So that in a practical term, guys, if your wife is the one that's saying, honey, get out of bed, we've got to go to church, you're already on the downhill side of things. You're already missing the point. Because really, you should be the one who's getting up and saying, you know, let us go up to the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. You should be the one saying, honey, it's Sunday morning. I know you're tired, but we've got to get the kids up, and I'll help you get the kids dressed and get them washed up and ready, and we'll get out the door and we'll go to church together because we need to worship God together as a family. You'd be amazed, gentlemen, how that would change your wife's perspective. I mean, once she got over the shock, once you got the defibrillator and got her heart started again and going again, <laughs> she would just be going crazy. But if you're the guy saying, ah, oh, you know, I just, I don't know, I just feel like laying, I'm tired. And, you know, that game starts at 10. And I, I don't want to miss that game because this, I mean, when will be the next time that I'll get to see the Seahawks lose again? <laughs> and my wife says, next week. Uh, but, you know, it's a... No, I don't want to pick up the Seahawks. We got the Cougars. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's like, I remember one day God just spoke to me and said, you know, as you've watched these football games over the years, how different has it been? <laughs> I mean, isn't it kind of the same thing over and over again? Now, my wife used to always say, why do you watch this? It's the same thing week in and week out. And I thought to myself one day, because I'm hoping that this week it will be different. <laughs> But it never is. 
But what is different is when I go into the house of the Lord with my family and, and God speaks to us, not just to me, but he begins to speak to us as a family. I mean, you think about this. I, I, when I just do these seminars sometimes, people actually, you guys are very fortunate because the last seminar, I think they paid $450 a couple to be at the seminar. They didn't pay me $450, <laughs> but, but it was really interesting because I just felt like saying, you know, uh, I'm going to make you laugh, I'm going to make you cry, and you're going to kiss $450 good dollars goodbye. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, I hope it's worth it. But the thing that's you know, kind of interesting is that when you begin to be that kind of man, you realize that my job is to protect my family, to protect my wife spiritually more than anything else. Because when you begin to become sensitive to the Holy Spirit in your life, you become that man of God. You're getting up and reading your Bible. You're getting up and praying. You're the one saying, let's pray. Let's go to church. Let's do these kind of things that are part of the Christian life. You'll find that your wife, maybe not overnight, immediately will begin to start relaxing and start trusting you. And she'll start listening to you. When you come to her and say, you know, I was praying this morning and I just felt like God said to me, X, Y, Z. I remember one very critical point in our, in our lives where I, I, I just... I, the Lord had been trying to deal with me for about two years on the issue, and I'd just been running from him. And finally, finally God just cornered me, and I just said, okay, God, I, I surrender. And then I, I went to my wife, and I said, honey, I, I've been praying, and I feel like God showed me that we're supposed to do this thing. And, I, and it scares me to death, but I, I just feel like this is what God wants us to do. And, she, and I said, but I'm not going to ask you to agree with me. I want you to go and pray and seek the Lord and see if the Lord tells you the same thing. Well, a week went by, nothing. And two weeks went by, and so I said, Honey, uh, have you been praying about that? And she said, Yeah. I said, Has God spoken anything to you? And she said, No, I, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't heard anything from the Lord on it. But I tell you what, I trust you. I trust you've heard from God. And if you believe this is what God wants us to do, then, then I, I'll support you in it. But if you're wrong, I'll never forgive you. <laughs> and so I said, Let me go pray about it some more. <laughs> But I mean, that's kind of honesty, I tell you, I have to deal with. It was like, uh, but the simple fact was, I did go back and pray, and finally came back and said, no, this is, I, I can't live with myself if, I, if we don't do this. And it's been interesting, because from that moment where we made that decision, God has blessed us in ways that we had never anticipated. I mean, it's just, I don't want to get too many details, because I don't want to, sometimes you share what God shows you, and other people think that's for them, and it's not. It's for me. And I don't teach people what God showed me. But he showed me this. And it's one of those kind of things you realize that it was so good. But the point was, she was saying, I've watched your walk with God enough. I see that you're trying to follow God and you're listening to him. I trust you when you make decisions. But there was a time when she didn't trust me because she saw me as being proud and selfish, self-promoting, seeking my own, thinking of my interests first. She all these other things. And so she was never quite sure that I was really looking out for her welfare. And see, isn't that the tough part? You say to a woman, you need to submit yourself to her husband. And she looks at him saying, he's not safe. He's not safe. And I ask you guys, are you safe? Does your wife feel spiritually safe under your covering? Or is it like... Walking across Niagara Fall with a, without, a, without a net, you know, on a wire. It's like, oh man, I hope I make it to the other side because this guy might let me go at any moment and I'm going to perish. You see, so many times when we, 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 we really ramp out on the women, we just really drill them pretty hard, but we have to understand that we're asking them to trust us. I don't trust you. And yet she's supposed to trust you. There's a second way you need to provide and that's emotionally. And you see, it's interesting that as a guy, because I'm so limited in my mental capacities and so incapable of really understanding the mind of a woman, that as a result, to be sensitive to my wife's emotional needs is really an uphill climb. It's like the story I heard of the guy one time who, who uh, was walking along the beach and he found this this uh, this. Uh, vessel on the side of the beach and he took it and he started polishing it and cleaning out and all of a sudden this genie appeared and he says master you have released me from a thousand years of captivity inside of this vessel therefore I will grant you any wish you want anything you ask I'll give it to you and he said thought for a long time he said you know what he said I've always wanted to go to Hawaii but I'm afraid to fly and I'm afraid of water so what I would like you to do is build a land bridge from San Francisco to the Hawaiian Islands the, the genie looked at him and said, you know, I have the power 
That's not the problem. But if I do that, I'm going to have to ravage the earth of all of its natural resources. The rest of humanity will be impoverished for all time in the future if I do this thing for you. This is a very real frustration. And guys, if you feel sometimes you're frustrated, like I'm trying to understand my wife, but I don't understand my wife, you can't do it in your own energy, but you can by the revelation of the Holy Spirit that God can begin to give you a sensitivity to things that matter to her if you're listening and you're caring to care. So that not only do you begin by providing spiritually, if you provide spiritually, God begins to give you a sensitivity so you can begin to respond emotionally. And you know what Jesus said about the material stuff? He says, don't worry about it. Whatever you need, I'll take care of. I'll provide. Don't give worrisome thought to what you will eat and what you'll put on. I'll take care of that. All I can tell you, and I don't want to go into details, all I can tell you is we have tried to live by that principle, and we are pretty humbled. I mean, we're pretty humbled. I, the, 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 the things that are done for us in the most interesting ways, uh, all I can say is we live way beyond our pay grade, and we don't deserve it. But it just keeps on happening, and I just think, Lord, we've just made this decision that we're going to live for you. It's kind of like Paul. I love what Paul said. He said, you know, I don't possess anything, and yet he says, I possess all things. And what he was saying, he said, because I've learned to be content in whatever situation I'm in. Whether impoverished or, or in, in plentitude, he says, I've learned to be content. And the po point was that I don't own anything, but every time I need something, I have it. And you see, that's the kind of life that God wants us to live. That Not where we're out there saying, first I'll secure my financial future and then I'll serve God. But I've had guys come to me and say, you know, I'm going to go out and make a bunch of money and then I'm going to be able to serve the Lord based upon my investments and I won't have to take an income from the church. And I've told them, and it's come to pass every time, you will never be in the ministry. And they say, why not? I said, because you're afraid to trust God. You're afraid to trust God. You see, that's why when I say to you, first care for the spiritual needs of your family. You know what that means? That means maybe you're not going to spend as much time trying to make money. That means maybe you're going to begin to readjust your schedule. And I'm at this place in our life right now where, you know, I'm, I was a kind of a, a, never a good one, but I enjoyed sports. I just enjoyed sports. I love playing golf. I love playing tennis. I love skiing. Uh, there was things that I did with great devotion. When I moved to Spokane, it was like a dream come true. I got three ski mountains all around me. I just jump in the car and drive there and I'm there. I said, this is what I've been dreaming for my entire life. And I never go anymore. And I don't play tennis. And I don't play golf. And for one very simple reason, uh, my wife won't go with me. Uh, she told me finally after dragging her up on a mountain for years, you know, it's cold. I don't like it. <laughs> Golf looks boring to me. <laughs> and, but, you know, it's one of those kind of things I thought, you know, I would rather take what time I have and spend it with my wife than spend, rather than spending six hours on a golf course every week because I only have one day out of the week that I can spend with my wife. And many times not even that because I travel so much. And so you begin to sit down saying, what is really matters to you? What really is important? And the thing that you say, this is going to be the thing I'm going to focus on first. The thing that's most important for us is to spend time with God, spend time with each other, and then whatever else is gravy. But you see, seek first the kingdom of God, and he'll take care of everything else. But you, if you look at your life, if you don't do that, you know what happens? There's tension in the home, your wife is frustrated, and you get into what Egger, Eggerson Emmerich calls the crazy cycle. You ever been in the crazy cycle? You just keep on going around and around and around. And finally, the argument ends when you get too tired to fight anymore. And you say, how did we start this? And both of you look at each other. I don't really remember how it got started. But I'm sure there was a good reason. And there was. But it wasn't the reason that started the argument. And that's what we'll talk about next time. A little bit about that crazy cycle. I want to go in further. I want to go to that passage that you've been waiting for me to get to. You know, Ephesians 5. Five. I know you guys love that, love that, but uh, anyway, I feel like I've rambled. I hope it made sense. Anyway, let's pray. Father God, I just pray that you bless your people. You'd help them to grow and to increase in their knowledge and understanding of your ways. And God, that they could begin to understand that the root of their problems in their marriage isn't each other, it's sin that's in each of us. And until we begin to let you show us our sin and begin to repent of our sin one to another, 
as soon as, uh, until we begin to say, God, there is a sin issue that is, is wrecking our marriage, we'll never change. So God, I pray that you'd give us the grace to, to hear your heart and understand these things in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen.